What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bars, Quest Nutrition, Hint Water, Einstein Bagels, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many events in the e-commerce industry too. Rise25 hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, probably coming to a city near you. Not yet in in Georgia, Erica. But um, if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com. Contact us to find out when and where our next event is going to be and if it's a fit for you. Um, I am very excited today. I have loved this product. I've, I've had it. It's delicious. Uh, we have Erica Shahusky, founder of Good Zebra, which is a protein-packed animal cracker set out to challenge the snack food industry. Now, Erica, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure animal crackers have had any innovations in the past 20 years. I remember them when there are those little red packages with the circus animals in them. And as yours are way different because those are behind bars and yours are kind of free spirits, I guess you could say. Um, but what's interesting about the animal crackers is that you guys have 12 grams of protein per two ounce serving. There's no refined sugar. It's sweetened with only organic honey and coconut sugar and has no artificial ingredients or preservatives. And the 11 unique spirit animals, animals are inspired by street and tattoo art. And the flavors include vanilla, lemon, and chai with peanut butter and chocolate not far behind. Probably when you're listening to this, they may already have it. Erica has worked with a diverse clientele before starting Good Zebra from the Rolling Stones, she's going to tell all, to the (laughs) Olympic Games. And Good Zebra can be found in Pete's Coffee and Tea across the nation, select retailers on Amazon and on the Good Zebra website. Erica, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. What an intro. It's all true. Um, So where do we start? I mean, I think you have such a, you know, here's, here's what I do a lot of research ahead of time. And this lady Shirley said this about you. Okay. She said, Erica is one of the best marketing experts and brand builders. Her clear focus and strategic direction led our brands to new levels. So what was she referring to? Oh, that's a really good one, actually. Um, Shirley is somebody that I worked with when I was in the footwear industry, launching a brand into China Mm. and really trying to ensure that we took an existing brand that had an incredible amount of recognition and award-winning characteristics from a branding perspective, because the product always delivered against the branding's principles, and took it into a country where, although it had recognition and demand prior to getting there, you still had to protect what it looked Mm. like as a brand and ensure that in that protection circle, you were also still delivering against the need, wants, or desires of that community for this brand. And so really having to educate is one thing, but when you really take something into another country, you're establishing and then educating, right? So not only the customer, but also every single person that touches the brand. What was the tough parts about going to bring that into China? I oh, feel like there's a lot of challenges there. <laughs> that list could be longer than this discussion. Um, I would say that moving into China, the most challenging thing is ensuring that something is understood. So mm-hmm. we may take, you know, the the there's there's comic routines out there um, galore that we know about about going into Southeast Asia and some famous movies um, that we may take. 50 words to describe something and really connect to someone emotionally. But when you move into a country where the language doesn't translate as easily, it's not as Western, Mm. diminishing those words in a way that you understand and can communicate and see in a human being's eyes, whether or not they got it is probably the most challenging things. The amount of time spent with boots on the street, I would suggest was the biggest challenge. So would you say having that experience in China made selling animal crackers easier or or not or maybe not as easy 
So I think every experience in life actually sets you up for where whatever is next. And I kind of say, I, people hear me say all the time, trust the process and know that the layers and layers and layers of experience all correspond to something. I would say it would be very far-fetched for me to find a connection between the China experience, launching footwear brands, and launching a better-for-you snack brand in America. Um, although I am building something that I choose to see as a global brand in the future and are am very conscious about that from even just naming the product will this translate in every country and mm. the simplicity behind the name was yeah. actually very much taken into account because I have picked up brands throughout my career that their name didn't translate or meant something that could be like construed as negative or, or offensive and so I was really cautious about a word good good can be translated in every language in the world. And then, of course, zebra is a known entity in the animal hmm. kingdom, if you will. And so I was very conscious of the name from that perspective. But um, I, I would have a difficult time connecting my experience of launching a brand hmm. in China with launching this food company. <laughs> you had an interesting exercise that you went through to name the company, right? I did. So I what did. What did you do? That's actually, you really did do your homework. Um, I'm impressed. So I, you know, as a branding person, and, you know, I think the intro really spoke to that. You know, you have, a, I have over 20 years of experience working on. You're not just going to throw software. something to get, throw a name together no, with your background. Not. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I didn't believe that I was going to spend years trying to do it or work with market research firms or go through extensive um, additional layers. But um, somewhere inside me, I knew that once we got the name right, I would know immediately that it was right. <clears throat> so it kind of started, or I shouldn't say kind of, it started with the fact that I had a turquoise uh, paper mache zebra head in my office. Why? And it was <laughs> kind of over my shoulder and for many years when I decided I was done with the discussion or didn't want to actually have a discussion I would say talk to the zebra and it became a hand, living kind of zebra. What, why did you have that in your office what was it from because I liked it it was pretty oh. I saw it in Paris okay. I liked it I carried it home under my arm on one of those trips around the world that I was on in the footwear industry and it moved from office to office with me, and I just loved it. And it kind of became known as me. She she would get dressed up. She would have on big sunglasses or a scarf on occasion or a long necklace. And it was just the, you know, a paper mache piece of art. And it just became part of me. So when I decided to go off and take this exercise seriously, um, the team that I worked with was actually my team um, from Nine West um, that I uh, – Asked them to volunteer and come over late at night, and we spent, you know, evenings trying to build what this looked like. And they wanted to name the company "Talk to the Zebra" because that's what they were used to hearing. You know, it's like comical, and I said, eh, "It doesn't feel right." You know, um, I'm not even sure how I feel about something animal related because when we originally launched, we weren't even trying to make animal crackers. We were, it was the idea around better for you cookies that were free of refined sugar, um, really firing on the principles of trend and trend based marketing. And I know that doesn't answer. Uh, we can talk about that in a few no, minutes. I was, I was going to, I mean, that's the next question I was going to ask, but keep going. Like why yeah. animal crackers, but go on. Yeah. 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 So I guess now I have a lot of storytelling to yeah, do here. So cool. may not bore you, but <laughs> The so, so the name, I'll get back to the name and yeah. then I'll go into the animal cracker bit. So, you know, we sat down and we said, okay, you know, zebra, let's take that one out off the table. Talk to the zebra seems too long and complicated. It doesn't sound like food on all these aspects. And knowing that we wanted to make cookies that were free of refined sugar, high in protein, grab and go. We were thinking avocado fat based, almond flour, honey sweetened, you know, really complicated product. This is talking uh, dirty to someone who's really healthy, by the way. Right. So, yes, I love it. Yeah. I felt about it too, but it also made me think farmer's market, right? So immediately, you know, that was the kind of aspect of the product. And how do you grow, grow, grow a brand out of a farmer's market when you're in your 40s? Not likely going to happen. You know, I'm not going to build that way. And it also felt a little small for my taste. And what I was seeking um, was something on a much larger scale. I felt go big or go home. So when we sat down to do the name, I asked for three um, lists to be created. Let's create a list of the kind of company we want to work for, 
What is the ethos? What are the what are what are the words that you want the company to feel like? The words that back the kind of team you want to work with, and then how would you verbally describe the product? Unrelated to actually having a product, so it wasn't as if we knew we wanted to make only cookies or we only wanted to make snack food. It was more around what's the type of product and coming out of the fashion space and realizing that you know there's ethical fashion is trending and lots of other things we felt like describing the kind of product we wanted to be around was as important as the people or the co- or the company in general so from that exercise we created very long lists and then we took those lists and we put them together and we started finding what words were similar and really had a lengthy like in heartfelt discussion around what they were and why and it was nanoseconds before we had a list of eight words that describe mm. people, the product and the company culture that we wanted to be a part of. And then ironically, those words also defined a zebra. Really? It wasn't even a stretch. It was like, I, I kind of threw the zebra out the window and then it came right back at us. Mm. And th- they were words such as, you know, female, female led and really female centric. And that felt important to us. Um, all of that were involved in the project, just because what was happening as an undercurrent, remember this is 2015, um, the very beginning of 2015, January 23rd of 2015 that we did this exercise actually. And so it was, you know, as trend watchers, we could feel a female undertone before the rest of the world was talking about it because it's what we it's what we do. Like we, as marketers and as brand builders as data driven brand people, you start to see things before the rest of the world sees them. Kind of a good thing. That's how I would never want to be in fashion for that reason. (laughs) It's so true. Is there, and there's a lot of luck involved as well. I mean, the trend is one thing, but luck is another part of it. But so we started to see this female factor, and so being female was very important to us. Um, and ironically, zebras move in a harem, so they're very female centric. Um, they're fearless. They actually don't have a fear gene, and we felt like fearless mm, was really. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and so what they do is that when they hear something or when something creates the sense of um, what we would describe as fear, they huddle together and then their stripes create something that's a larger mass and harder mm. to attack. Um, and so they're very protective of one another, which also kind of rooted into these words. Um, and then just to give you one more example, they're also very loud. And for me as a marketer, <laughs> I was tired of asking permission. I wanted to be mm. in a place where I could ask yeah. for forgiveness again. Yeah. And we've become so because regulated. Because of the corporate sense, the corporate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you're always saying, can we, why not? You're always trying to push the boundaries as a marketer and no, and when you play it safe in branding and marketing, in my personal opinion, you never win because safe is, is not how winning brands are built. They're built by taking a sense of risk and weighted risk. And it doesn't mean that it's inauthentic. It just means a sense of weighted risk around how you talk and how bold you are. And so that was very important to us. And so Zebras are very loud. Well, I notice with everything that you do, it <laughs> as a unique piece of it, right? It's not like a me too piece. Like even from, yeah, you could just use normal animals, but it it's kind of goes in your branding, which what's going to stick out, yeah. right? Like it's you're true. not going with normal animals. You go with street tattoo, street and tattoo art. You know, you're not going with just typical animal cracker. You go with something that's packed with a ton of protein. Like there's a lot of differentiators there kind of every step of the way it seems thank you for noticing um but um did you come up with that in one night i feel like some people this would be like a six month process for for a lot of people one night one night after work did you lock the door and you said we're not leaving until we figure out (laughs) enough it wasn't even that dramatic i'd say the word good took us a couple of days afterwards of like long text message arguments amongst one another because we played with words like treat and snack and, you know, as the secondary word. Um, I mean, there's like a zebra snack or a good or or a tasty treat or, you know, do we do we play with some of those other words that are conjure up something that's a bit more emotional. And I actually remember the moment where I decided that good is exactly the right word because it was the moment that when I said to you, we originally started launching a product or a product line that was avocado fat based, honey sweetened, almond flour, like all these incredible things. And 
the type of sweets that I want to eat. Um, but what happened when we started, when I started speaking to factories and production facilities and such, the allergens, the lack of shelf life, all of the reasons that you want to eat them are also the, the reasons that they're very challenging to put in a package, which right. is where the bar business is won by mushing them all together and having kind of, you know, right. you make it sound so appetizing. Yeah. functional food but that yeah. doesn't necessarily taste like a cookie and so in that in that moment um when when i was thinking about okay how do you take that idea that people have gotten so used to eating bars and actually turn it into something that's a bit more modern and unique and breakthrough and really think about taking what are the elements of a bar that we want we want quick food we want grab and go portions and portion control oftentimes and and the kind of the lead element is protein for so many people and so how do you take that and modernize it and so in that moment i said well one of the greatest things in the world is not understanding where people are in their spectrum of of need wants or desires or how can we bring people along the journey? And I had an aha yeah. moment when I said, you know, when you start to describe food and you think good, better, best, or you think something about, you know, okay, yeah, that was a, that was an okay decision, and then you could make a good decision that's solid and you can live with it, or the best decision is let's eat our fruits and vegetables. Let's like really turn to like core things that are raw or uncooked or juicing or things. But that as a nation, we're somewhere on a spectrum yeah. that isn't over there, and yeah. that juicing can be really trendy and great, and I love it, and I juice, but is everybody ready for that end of the spectrum? And right. so why not take a word that actually describes a, a place where I felt like the masses could meet us in the journey, and a product right. had a recognition for, and meet them somewhere that brings them into a better decision-making cycle than perhaps a pre-existing animal cracker or another cookie or a sugar filled protein bar or, you know, French fries or potato chips. If you want to go to the other, you know, extreme and that meeting people in that journey. And so the word good said exactly that to me. It doesn't mm. over Gotcha. And it actually makes you feel exactly yeah. good about your decision. That's, I love that because I was having a conversation with another person the other week, and one of their criteria for a product is whatever it is. Doesn't mean if it's uh, edible or physical product is not having to change someone's habits because he felt like it was so hard. Like you're saying, you meet them where they're at. If you have a product that's trying to change their habits completely, that's yeah. a little bit of an uphill battle. Yeah. You know? And changing their habits is also something di- in addition, which is quite often, not only educating the end consumer, but then you're going to have to educate the retailer. You're going to have to educate the factories. You're going to have to educate everybody on something that's so foreign that it's, it's an uphill battle at the end, but it's also an uphill battle to get to that point. Right. So, you know, I want to talk about why animal crackers, right? (laughs) But I want to even step back a little bit further. Why food? Because obviously your background, I mean, you've years and years in the sporting industry. You've been years and years in the fashion industry, what was on the chopping block before you got to, okay, I want to do this food company? Yeah, yeah that's such a good good question. You know, my last couple of years in the, in the footwear industry had become a little bit unhealthy, would be an understatement of the century, a bit toxic. And I felt like I, it, I, I'd hit a burnout and I was way too young for that. You know, you, you, I remember as a kid coming out of college thinking I would read job descriptions for director level jobs or VP jobs mm. and I'd say, I'm going to be there. And I, that's exactly what I want to do. And, you know, I, I knew ex- exactly what my mission was and how I was going to get there. And then, unfortunately, when I got there, um, I, you know, I had wonderful experiences and they all layer into the thing I was telling you earlier, which is that these experiences create the layers of your own personal onion that bring you the resources and tools to do whatever it is you're dreaming of. And how you access those is up to you. However, for me personally, I had just this really unhealthy layer in the end that felt as if I'm not really sure I want to continue in this space. Mm. Um, I was also the writing is on the wall. I mean, retail is in in turmoil. They're um, on all, every aspect, not just fashion, but of course, fashion's hit first because it's you know disposable. Where food is obviously, or right. fitness retail, or you know some of the boutique related stuff is a little different. It's later lagging. 
But these decisions around fashion and the challenges and and the lack of modernization was really what was getting me. I had spent a couple, about 10 years in financial services and most importantly in technology related financial services. So I remember we would sit in boardrooms or meeting rooms, whatever they were, and an idea would come up and it would be in motion before you left that room. Acts and action were very I mean, you know, discussions and action were very closely tied. And in the fashion industry, it was unbelievably slow. Mm. Broken infrastructure, lack of innovation. You know, so I, I felt like, do I really want to be a part of this when I don't feel as if the solution is being accepted? Um, and so it was, that was the foundational kind of aha moment of, do I want to stay in this space? And so while doing that, I had spent several years struggling with on the go eating myself and had kind of hit my personal max. Just because you're so busy. So busy. Yeah. yeah. And traveling a lot. And so packing stuff in your luggage. I'm a born and bred vegetarian. So really? I've never tasted meat in my life. Wow. And, your and parents so, were or? They were. They were. Child of hippies. <laughs> And so it really limited my um, snacking ability to keep snacks healthy and in motion. And, and, and so I felt for me personally, I was seeking something that I didn't find a solution for on the marketplace. And I kind of like had a little seedling idea that if I ever came up with a product that I thought would be commercial, commercially viable, I would go out and do it. But it wasn't as if I was born and raised and said, I want to be an entrepreneur. I've always wanted to launch my own product. I'm not a serial entrepreneur. You're not going to hear that this is my 27th time or anything. But what I had always done in every job I've ever had has been a problem solver. Mm -hmm. So I'd always, from a very early point in my career, had the opportunity to work with some really incredible CEOs that would always, you know, they'd throw projects out there and people would say, yeah, we don't really have that. Just call Erica, she'll figure it out. And it didn't mean I did everything, but I asked the right questions and went to the right people and brought the right group together. Resourceful. And Resourceful. Yeah. And so for me, I felt like, oh, those are the perfect skill sets to going out and trying to figure out whether this is of interest. And so the more I dug into the data um, and, and what consumers were seeking and the lack of response from the food industry as a whole to attain that product that the consumer was looking for, um, I felt like there was there's enough data here to back up a business. And yeah. why not? Sir, so, I feel like, you know, a lot of times the grass is always greener for whatever. So yeah. if someone's in corporate, there's a pain around being stifled. And but there's advantages to that. And then from an entrepreneur perspective, you have the freedom, yeah. but there's advantages to that. And people may see, oh, there's more secu- there's security, stability. When yeah. you stepped in, and I don't think it's an easy decision, personally, I don't think whether you had so much pain around leaving the, the corporate world, I think that's a really it's still a tough decision. Maybe at the time it didn't seem tough because it sounded like you're like, I'm just ready to get out of this. Yeah. But when you stepped into the entrepreneur and your own company, what did you see as the advantages of being an entrepreneur? And what did you see as looking back, okay, like this was pretty cool in yeah. the, in the other space. Sure, that's such a great question. And and a little bit thorny for me because there's a lot of angles I could take that one. <laughs> I would say that for me personally, I didn't sit in a corporate job saying, "Oh, I want to go and launch my own business." I I don't have the story of spending a year with a night shift of doing both. Um, that wasn't me at all. Um, I felt like I had a very demanding role that I, um, treasured my team and felt very actively engaged in the business and that that was fulfilling me and giving me what I was looking for. I just saw thought for me, I saw the industry very broken and a lack of innovation to fix it Mm. in a space where it was just going to get increasingly more challenging to win because of not just players like Amazon, but in general, people who have found a way to do it better, faster, quicker, whether it's make the product, sell the product, get the product to the end consumer or reinvent retail as we know it now. And so I, you know, kept feeling like, oh, how do you, how do you really help resolve this when you're somewhere where moving a, you know, battleship in a bathtub is not easy when you work for a big giant brand in an even bigger umbrella company. And so when I chose to leave, I actually didn't leave with the intent of launching a brand. Mm. 
um, I moved on and, and said, okay, I'm going to take a little downtime. I'm pretty worn out. And I immediately started interviewing and I, you know, three weeks after leaving, I had this brainstorming session where my team showed up at my house and they put their hands on their hips and they said, we're going to launch a brand tonight. And we launched it and we created the idea of good zebra. And I went online and bought the URL and the signed up for the Facebook page and did all of the necessary, you know, foundational stuff, called my attorney and paid the registration fees and did all of these things. I didn't take it seriously. Mm. I very much said, no, nah, okay, I'll play with it. But it was more because I was being pushed to do it and less of being pulled from my own emotions. So I had people kind of pushing and encouraging it. And my own emotions were still, mm, there's so many like jobs and opportunities. And so I still went on interviews. Mm-hmm. And what happened is I spent four, about four months until April of that year digging into every opportunity that was out there. And what I found is that I would get almost physically ill. Hmm. I would go on these (laughs) interviews and think, oh my God, like there's nothing that sounds worse than that job. (laughs) And it it wasn't this need to be on my own. It was this need to not be a part of one of these engines again, but I didn't know how else to get out of it. So it was almost like my escape plan, (laughs) which sounds because obviously I think we all want to have a backup plan or a plan B at times and so I explored that and then you know I have a poem that is on I taped it in my on the back of my house door on the way to exit the house which is so strange and one day I in middle of April I was on my way out the door and I decided to stop and read it and the opening sentence said until one is fully committed providence cannot occur Hmm. Why was that taped? You taped it on there? I did. Just a long time ago. Yeah. And mm. it's so long ago that I didn't even, I don't even. It's just, you don't even see it anymore. It's just exactly. background. And that was there. And I thought, that's it. I'm done. So what and is I'm, it? Say it one more time. What is it? Until one is fully committed, providence cannot occur. Hmm. And for me, it, it immediately said to me, either put both feet in to finding a job or both feet in to creating a brand. Hmm. And I went with Grace to the interview I was on my way to, and I bowed out of that discussion with just as much grace, and I went and met my attorney the next day and made everything official, and it's been game on since then. But that was the moment that made me say, if I'm going to do this, I really have to do this. I can't be in play- both places. It's tough. And so I think I'm a little different. I, I wasn't always wanting to be an entrepreneur or digging around. I yeah. had a a, a built-in desire for a product like this that I couldn't find, and therefore I just spent the time proving that other people were seeking it as well. Yeah, I feel like that that kind of story is more common than people realize. You know, yeah. people kind of falling into it is not something they've dreamed about from a young yeah. kid, but they're just feeling a need that they wanted, um, and that just it's kind of that opportunity met timing, right? Yes. Um, so. At that night when you did the name, did you decide that it was going to be Animal Crackers? No. You didn't. So <laughs> so what? at what point was the Animal Cracker thing uh, yeah. it? So that was probably five months later after hitting, you know, the am I really doing this moments, those four months that I just talked about, job interviewing, taking it mm-hmm. not so seriously, meeting with commercial kitchens, meeting with production facilities, knowing that I really didn't want to open a bakery and go, I don't, I don't get up at four in the morning. This isn't going to happen. So when I start thinking about like, oh, yeah, that doesn't work for me. Like, I'm not a morning person. Okay, so next, you know, I'm kind of constantly seeking what was, what felt like the next answer to that. Um, I realized that I'd hit so many roadblocks associated with trying to make the original product that I went out there to make. And Which was ultimately- a protein cookie. That was like kind of the original okay. idea cookie that was free of refined sugar but that was also like made with avocado as the fat and sweetened you know without refined sugar and almond flour because I you know was gluten free it was like it was trying to be a bit too much I think ultimately but more importantly it was so niche oriented that the manufacturing facilities thanks good thank goodness were saying to me even if we can figure out how to make this and commercialize it for you how are you going to get somebody to to try it it doesn't even sound good. It might taste good, but it doesn't sound good. And after a series of enough no's, I said, okay, that's it. I quit. 
like I, I give up, you know, I kind of had one of those. And the same day that I made this like declaration, I remember sitting, I, I meditate and I'm a very spiritual person. And I remember sitting and taking the time to meditate and then move to my journal and, and, and kind of like, okay, I have peace. I've made peace with this decision. And I went to bed and at somewhere around two twenty in the morning, you notice I actually don't know around it is two twenty in the morning. I sat straight up. And something hit me that made me pull out the original idea boards from the night we named the company, which I have no idea why I saved them, but I saved all these. I mean, New York City apartments are the size of a thumbnail, and I saved these sheets of paper, these giant yes. whiteboarded papers. And, um, and I flip chart papers, sorry. And I laid them down my hallway from one into the other, and I just paced up and down it all night long until sometime around six o'clock in the morning, I saw what it was that I was seeking, which was spirit animal crackers. And they were on the list of original ideas and I had circled them and marked through them and wrote kids food phase three. Hmm. What like does that, that was mean? response to animal crackers because hmm. I immediately thought kids food and I felt like I am, I am actually, I'm not a parent. Um, I'm a godparent to a lot of wonderful kids and I do love children, but I'm not a parent myself. So I felt like I didn't have the authority to talk about the needs of a parent or this space for children. And that was my response to it at the time. I think that it's very easy to take a brand that's established and diversify what I would call down to children versus taking a, a kid's brand and mm. try and bring it back up to adults. Mm. And so I felt like, okay, yeah, you can do that once you're an established brand. And I felt pretty strongly about it. But what all of a sudden, then the idea said, yeah, but guess what? 94% of us snack daily. 50% of our calorie consumption in America comes in the form of a snack. That to me says snacks have to have more to them and that protein is the obvious. So, okay, could, could we, could we go after them? Then there's a nostalgic connection to adults for animal crackers. I think, as you said in your opening, it's been 20 years, more than 20 years since anybody's done anything to the animal cracker. Um, and that pro quite possibly longer than that. I think animal crackers have been around, I think it's something like 1881. Wow. <laughs> when they were brought over and they're tea biscuits and they you know, they kind of evolved into what we know as animal crackers and then no one's really touched it. And quite frankly, the label hasn't even been cleaned up. It still has, you know, high fructose corn syrup in it and some of the things that we know better than to have in a label. And so when I started really thinking about the principles of the company that I wanted to build and thought, could we apply it? So then I took the, the animal cracker idea, the spirit animal cracker idea, and said, okay, how do you make it adult? You make them not look like cartoon characters. They need to look like adult characters or adult animals. They need to have a sense of, you know, extra detail. Like everything that makes it more complicated is everything that also makes it more interesting. And you need to find somebody that's ready to innovate this category and could they see this as innovation? And so that's what I set out to do. So what did the first version look like? Um, so the first version actually isn't a whole lot different than where we are today. Mm -hmm. to what was the first flavor you went with? The, we launched all three at the same oh, time. Oh, you did? Okay. And I launched at the same time. We, of course, um, from a um, formula perspective, we first worked on the vanilla. And um, that was just because it's the base. It's kind of the, you know, when you think about like a sugar cookie or a base. You could always just, add to the vanilla. Exactly. You can always layer flavor into something. And so the vanilla um, was the original kind of, it's the base of the product. Mm -hmm. But um, we launched the first three together. And ever since then, we've been just racing to try and get new flavors in the market. So why lemon and chai? I mean, those aren't your, your typical flavors, right? Yeah. So just like everything else, I wanted to be untraditional, if you will. Um, it, it, you know, when you're trying to launch something that you want to go into an adulting way with something that's childlike, um, the I, the easiest way to do it um, that's more natural is, you know, is it to the mind is the flavors. The second easiest was the design of the product, right, or the second most obvious. And so ensuring that the the product shapes the packaging and then the flavor profiles really spoke to this adult element. And what I, what we love about the product is it's actually a great product for the whole family. So, so R&D, what was it like to, I mean, cause you have vanilla and now you're going to 
you're probably brainstorming different flavors. Yeah. You know, which would be typically like chocolate and peanut butter, but you went a little different route. So how did yeah. you, what was your process for the lemon and the chai piece? Actually, our head of R&D came up with the idea. Hmm. So um, she started working just kind of trying to, when you, when you, when we, sorry, when you take the proteins that you put in there and you don't want to taste, you want to taste like a, a cookie or animal cracker and you want to have that immediate, you know what you expect it to taste like because you know what an animal cracker is when you put it in your mouth. Big part of that to cover the taste of proteins is ensuring that you use flavors that actually complement protein. Yeah. So she was the one that came up with these additional flavors that she felt would complement versus conflict with. Yeah, I got you. And at our original, we, we started in one facility that didn't allow nuts. So any nuts couldn't be in the, we couldn't have nuts in the products So peanut butter or almond butter, which is, you know, another one that we've toyed with weren't allowed. And then, um, these melting tanks to do chocolate are also, cause we we're using hundred percent, um, chocolate liqueur. So it's a very rich, you know, has to be melted and then folded into the product. So it just wasn't the best way to launch, if you will. Yeah. Like, let's, let's not add another layer of problem. Right. So talk about the protein for a second. How do you come to what you actually end up going with the protein source? Because I know you mentioned early on you wanted to go with the avocados and the other things. How did you come to what it looks like now? What's in it now and how did you come to it? Yeah, so our protein is a mix of whey protein, pea protein, and egg white. And the egg white is kind of a natural expected ingredient, I think, in a cookie um, or egg in general. So that, that's an obvious. I think that we don't need to talk about that. The pea protein was actually the most interesting because it's the one that we wanted to isolate, meaning we really just wanted to have pea protein as our main protein driver. But what we found is it really um, – it continues to make incredible improvements, but it still tastes like a pea. I mean, it tastes like green. It tastes like mm. grass. It tastes like the you know the ground and the the wonderfulness of of, of what it is. Right. It still has that flavor. So, the way it was added to create a bit more of a creaminess to it and and really kind of take away the bite, if you will, um, and. The I think it's more common even now if I you know think about protein powders um, we all grew up whether it was soy or whey and I wanted to avoid soy for my own personal health reasons um, and so it was like one or the other needs to be in there to create something that just tastes good we you know when when it all boils down yeah. to it, Someone's not going to get it if it doesn't. They don't like the taste. No, and and if it's not, you know, we talk about a name that's called good. The product has to be good. It, you know, there's plenty of protein bars out there that are masking flavors with sweeteners and sugars or chocolate chips or, you know, dipping them in in yogurt coatings or chocolate coatings or doing, you know, things to mask the flavor of good food. But we felt like, how do we not have to work so hard at masking it and actually yeah. just make it taste good? So you have the product, so now you're ready to do what you do best, right? Go out and market it. So what things did you feel worked well? What things did you feel they just didn't work as well as you thought they were going to? Okay, I would love to say that anything worked the way I expected it to. Um, you know, you you think that... You have dreams of grandeur, and um, it's very humbling to launch something. So I would say that I, I was naive in the thought that once we had a product and a proof of concept, it would be easy to launch a brand and raise the capital to actually really build a brand the way I know how to build a brand. And used a lot of the philosophies of this 25-year branding career that, that showed me, you know, you take these three exercises and you execute them great and you put to, you stay focused on three things at once. And I, I believe in a pillar of threes, three principles, three products launched at the same time. Mm -hmm. I really think that way is, is like about where our capacity is as humans to mm -hmm. accept. Things. And so I applied that to the marketing and I, it was shocking how um, vastly different it was and how much we needed to go out and um, retreat and re-message the product, mm -hmm. uh, including redoing the packaging, um, which, you know, was beautiful and it was great and it, you know, it worked 
functionally and it kept our shelf life and it did everything we wanted it to do, but it actually didn't convey clear enough to the consumer what it was that we wanted them to grasp with the product. And so I think that when you ask what, what works, it, it's like kind of nothing until you try it all. And and the only thing that, you know, I could say from it was the the heavy need to um, stop thinking that I know better or mm. launching a product from nothing is so much different than launching a sub product for a brand that's big and established or has a team or an engine or a budget. And <laughs> so you say it, it was humbling. Did you take this to groups of people? How did you get the feedback that you knew yeah. that to change those things? So in the first or the first six months or seven months, actually, that we were on the market with product, it was what I would like to refer to as the friends and family phase. Mm -hmm. So it, we launched a website. Um, we opened up an Amazon store. We got local coffee shops and retailers near the office, and we serviced them ourselves. So we went in and we stocked the shelves, and everything was on you know trial. You you know if it sells, you can pay us. If it doesn't, mm -hmm. that's it's yours. You just wanted to get your foot in the door. Wanted to get our foot in the door, and more importantly, we wanted to have the opportunity to go sit in those coffee shops and watch whether people purchased it. And then if they did ask them, why did you purchase this? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Would you share with us? And really kind of you know, introduce what it was that we were trying to learn from that process. And then we did more traditional focus groups as well. Um, what did people say? So they grab it off the shelf and you like stop yeah. them? What, what yeah. were they saying? So um, it, it would be interesting. Oh, well, we, we would get a lot of feedback of, um, oh, I love animal crackers. Like, number one, I love animal crackers. But you'd say, okay, but why did you make the decision to purchase animal crackers? Say, yeah, because I haven't seen animal crackers in a coffee shop before. So, you know, it was novelty. Okay, great. What about these animal crackers do you like? Oh, the designs are cool. And it would end there. Hmm. And so you you don't want to lead because you don't want to tell them you don't want to plant the answer. But ultimately, what what it became what became quite obvious was they weren't capturing the idea that this was a tasty trade for a boring bar. Like this is you know that's our marketing language, but this is nutritionally equivalent to a protein bar, um, if not superior. This had we have fifty percent more protein than the leading protein cookie on the market. 50% more per serving. Like, that's crazy difference in quantity. Lot, yeah. Um, and that we're free of refined sugar. And those messages were not coming across. And in and then once people heard it, they were like, oh, that's great. Awesome. Yeah, sure, I'd rather eat this than that. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I could also put it in my kid's lunchbox because my kid only eats carbohydrates and now I feel better about the carbohydrates or I could make a cheesecake crust with it over the holidays, you know, or I could do, you know, people were coming up, oh, this, you know, bowls are a big thing, whether it's an acai bowl or a yogurt bowl. I love or acai bowls, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I could use it as a topping. Like people were really getting into this and the, the most interesting, I'd say, um, kind of validation that happened in that phase was the one thing that people loved the most about the the packaging not taking away what the product was that we did leave in our next generation of packaging was the resealable top mm. even though it was a snack size bag so people think oh I'm gonna eat the whole bag it's 200 you know it's 230 calories I'm gonna eat the whole bag but in actuality that might be great if you have the time to sit still and eat a bag of cookies or crackers and particularly maybe if you're in motion moving somewhere or you have time in your office but in general most of us snack in a much smaller way like you grab something because it's in need and that in this case you could seal it back up and maybe finish it later or the next day and that was one of my insights from protein bars years of eating protein bars I would always break them in half Mm. fold it over and like seek a piece of tape or some way to keep it shut because I didn't want to eat the whole thing because I'm eating it because I have to or I'm running to a meeting. I think and you like, just invented the next innovation in protein bars, like some kind of resealable. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Darn it. Maybe that's what I should be doing. That's that's your next uh, the innovation on the good zebra, the packaging. Um, where did you see a breakthrough? So, I mean, obviously a lot of it's humbling. And, and I love what you talk about because I think a lot of people don't do it enough. Um, 
is actually talk to your customer because they pretty much have a lot of the answers that we're seeking. Um, what was the big breakthrough yeah. beside, like, after the humbling pieces? Where did sure. you're like, okay, like finally, I think I made the right decision here. Yeah. I would say that I'm still in the humbling mode. Okay. <laughs> the always, humbling well, always, mode. always be in the humbling mode is a good yeah, place to I be. Hope, so I actually hope I will be always there um, and incredibly grateful for the time that people give when they do choose to share feedback. What about Pete's co- I mean, Pete's not, not every, you know, company or product can get into Pete's coffee and tea. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? So, you know, we, I had the pleasure of meeting them at a trade show and I kind of, I saw them, I saw them walk by and they'd always been on my radar of like a dream location. I had lived in San Francisco when I was at E-Trade in the early days and, you know, had spent quite a bit of time in and out of California in general throughout my career and kind of always made that my, this is my coffee spot when I'm here. And so I had really coveted but I also covet their brand and kind of they have a you know I like to call it a cult like loyal following um, of consumers and so I had tried to get in touch with them and they're a really difficult company to get through to like they very you know they're they're very protective um, in regards to you know you don't just cold call them Um, and so and they don't have a cattle call when it comes to submissions of new products and such it's more around like they go out and they curate the way that they partner with people and are very conscious of that and so I, I had seen them walk by at a trade show and I just decided I'm going to go chase them down and talk to them and introduce myself and ask them if they'd come back to my booth because they had walked right by. And what's most fascinating about Pete's is that um, when we were developing our chai animal cracker, um, I said, I want this product to pair. I wanted all of our product to pair it with coffee. And it was very important to me because one of the key times during the day that I know I have to have a snack whether no matter how small it is, something has to go in with my coffee, the first couple sips of my coffee, or I get ill, racy and weird. Right, right. And so I think so many of us got whether you buy a Danish or a you know, another bar I won't name or something that's easy there when you're at the coffee counter. If you haven't had your breakfast and you're there getting your coffee, most people have the action of buying something else. So it was important to us that our formulas paired really well with coffee and that they kind of gave that moment mentally. And so the chai in particular, when we decided what coffee to pair it with, it was we ordered up Pete's and that's what we, so that's the story that I shared with them. And so they um, called us into the office, not not us personally, but the product in um, to do some internal testing, and they did, and that's how we ended up there. That's great. <laughs> the, and again, like you haven't taken the traditional route for marketing, even though that's kind of that's your background. Because um, I was reading, most people's strategy would be going into grocery. Correct. You actually took a much different strategy. Correct. Yeah. So again, another one of my philosophies is that I believe that the way we grocery shop today is so different than the way the grocery channel operates the business. So another um, story of, you know, my, my strong belief in a lack of innovation in a really important channel. So for so many years now, I couldn't even put the date on it when we all, as anybody being aware of world economics and discussions in the news, grocery is, was struggling channel of business. And people started talking about they were only shopping the perimeter. And nutritionists come out and say, you know, when you go to the grocery store, the best thing you can do is learn to only shop the perimeter. And everything in the middle is evil and everything on the outside is fine. You know, whether it's fresh meats, fresh dairy, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, they're all in the perimeter of the store. And so that, that, that complaint and that reality has been there for such a long time that I think it's ingrained in us that if we are going to shop the inner portion of a store, it's typically because there's an action that we need to fill. So, or, or a, a miss in our lives. So we need laundry soap. We need toilet paper. We need something that you're going exactly there for, but you're actually on a mission versus a shopping experience. We don't walk up and down the aisles to discover things. Unfortunately, I go and find the chip aisle and I go down and I look at everything, but yeah. Okay. So, so you have, you have a reason though, like there's a, there's a built in desire for you there of something that, that you're familiar with. And I think that that is, 
how people shop the internal portion of the store and but but wandering to check out new brands is an unusual behavior most yeah. people are there and they they brand recognition they know they're looking for the yellow bag and that yellow bag is lays and you don't have to read the label it's just auto and so in the in the journey to that space in a grocery store you have these ends of the aisle that they call end caps and that you walk by them and that's obviously you know the entree into that aisle it, it oftentimes indicates what's there so you get to the the aisle that has chips and there's an end cap filled with chips well in my you know, not so humble belief until retailers stop putting Doritos and Pepsi Cola on those end caps, you're not going to convince me to enter that aisle for a sense of discovery. You're going to remind me that, oh, maybe it is Super Bowl and those are items that I would choose to put in my house for a special occasion. But otherwise, you're not going to get me to break that aisle. Mm. And so with that mindset, until retailers choose to innovate the way that they merchandise a store, I felt felt like it, it doesn't make sense for us to go and beat ourselves up in that channel. It's a very expensive channel to do business in. And then the second is that um, because of the product being called Animal Crackers, immediately there's this autumn, you know, the, the retailer's response is, oh, cookie and cracker aisle. That's where it goes. And I would say, actually, I think we belong next to protein bars. Well, why? Well, we're these small bags. We're two ounce servings. It's a single controlled portion. We don't make large format packaging for a reason. It's not modern. It's not how people snack. Um, and that we have the protein equivalent to every major protein bar on the market. And that if you can't merchandise us with protein bars, we're not going to win because that is a place where people come for a sense of discovery or they're willing to mm -hmm. give a try because what's it's a different one? demographic. Yeah. yeah. And so between those two reasons, I felt like it was a lost, lost effort at this stage in the business. And so we really have focused the business model on coffee shops, fitness centers, airports. We're trying to get an airline right now. And is that uh, hard? Yeah, it is. It is. It's a price war. Hmm. It's a price war. And then hotel mini bars and really kind of like places that people want to hang out is how I like to describe mm. it. So where is a place that you have a bit more of a captive audience and a smaller, but hotel you have a lot mini bar is good. Yeah. Much harder to get there than right. Because they have many, many products at a grocery store and very few products at a coffee shop, for example. So, you know, you really have to win to get in there. But once you're in, you're in, hopefully you can prove your product by doing great demos and, traffic driving efforts to get people there and the sense of awareness. Yeah. So you have some short term stuff and then some longer term plays with cause mm -hmm. like someone gets into the airlines or even maybe a hotel chain or something like that, that, that could be huge. Yeah, um, exactly. So, you well, know, I, to your point about traditional marketing, um, in and untraditional marketing, it's, you know, I think that one of the things about being a, a very small brand in a sea of big brands the cost of entry is so significant, not just, you know, launching a product and, you know, packaging and, and, you know, the formulations and how do you really scale that and build a team, but the actual cost to take the marketing efforts somewhere beyond grassroots have been a bit more challenging. So we decided to focus on the places that we sold the product so that it did a little bit of the work for us and then a very digital based marketing plan. Yeah. Erica, so many questions, so little time. I'm yeah. looking and it just flew by. So I want to mention a few things because I know that you have a bunch of things on your schedule. One, I want to encourage people to go to goodzebra.com and specifically, and the products are delicious, but um, I took the spirit animal quiz <laughs> and uh, they have a spirit animal quiz. And um, I wanted to talk about that with you, but we don't have time for it. Um, and I was going to have you guess what my spirit animal is. I don't know. What do you know? What you're, did you, have you taken it recently? What's your spirit animal? Oh, of Based course I know what mine is. Okay. I think mine's pretty obvious. I'm clearly a zebra. Okay. Well, I didn't yeah. know what the choices were because yeah. I only got my, my choice. So I was the, uh, the turtle. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So I, I encourage people to check, check that. That should be in some magazine. Is that... Have they gotten into like Cosmopolitan or one of these magazines? Like, What's your spirit animal? I totally see that. Right. Have any of those picked it up? The, like, no, the one has picked, quiz? no one's picked up the quiz yet, but that would be, that's a good angle to get yeah, to that. Yeah, I like that. that. Um, so there's three things. I'm going to let you choose because I know yeah. we're out of time, but um, I want to talk about the challenges of female entrepreneurship. I have sure. that on my list. Also, 
Um, I don't know if there's a short Olympics or Rolling Stone story uh, <laughs> to finish on. I'm sure you have a lot of crazy stories. So I'll let you take your pick of one, two, or whatever. Okay, maybe I'll answer the Rolling Stones one first. So how about how we make it just a little bit of an interesting fact versus a crazy story? Well, whatever because, you like. Yeah, one of one of one of the things I pride myself on is the fact that I I don't hang out other people's um, stories um, unless they so choose to be a part of it. Okay. Okay. Fair um, enough. So, but I would say that's interesting about you know what, I had the pleasure of doing backstage parties and meet and greets with the Rolling Stones. And so, um, and being the worldwide sponsor. And so it was really a wonderful life chapter that I have an incredible amount of gratitude for having been a part of and one that I would never survive a second time. Um, Why is that? Way, way too much burning the candle at both ends mm. of the spectrum. You know, have a day job, which is called corporate, and have a night job, which was taking that corporate relationship and executing it with um, VIPs around the world. It's like a little too heavy for anybody to handle for too long, In my, for me at least, let's say. Mm. Um, however, something that I found super fascinating is the before every show, Mick Jagger or Mick um, runs. And what he does is they kind of quarantine a hallway and they put up pipe and drape in black and he just does laps back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and he kind of gets himself pumped up and in the zone. Mm. And when he's ready, he goes straight from that onto the stage. And so he kind of shows up to the stage already like body heated up and kind of ready to go. And mm. as the ultimate performer, like the guy who just turns it on when he's there, it was something that really um, stuck with me personally because it made me say, okay, what's your warm up going to be? Like mm. how do you make sure that every time you need to get on your own platform, whatever it happens to be, that you're ready to turn it on in the same way that he's already heated up and ready to go. So mm. I love that's that. Kind of a little snippet. So have you and figured out yours? Your, what's going to get you into state? Yeah. So mine happens to be meditation. Oh. Like I, take, I take a few minutes nice. and instead of going eyes closed, you know, sitting down, I actually stand in the mirror and I actually talk to myself in the mirror. And I make sure that I use the words looking myself in the eyes out loud that correspond to what it is that I want to convey. Mm. And not not rehearsing the message, but ensuring that if you know, I, I, you know, I want to remind myself to speak, you know, to be humble and yet speak with confidence. And, you know, so I like to use a lot of contradictory words. And so for me, I've used that technique ever since that moment in time. Mm. So, so should any of these VIPs like be eating good zebra, like these touring <laughs> companies that you used to work with? Shouldn't they all be eating good zebra? I'm just would, asking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. That's on the list. Okay. It's on the list. Just Don't you worry. Sure, just making sure. Yeah, the and Rolling I'm, Stone. Yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say just the you know the Rolling Stones and other people you you know who have who be like yeah we'll we'll bring good zebra on tour. Right, right. Or we'll just take a picture. Yeah, <laughs> How about take that? a picture. <laughs> I'll take, I'll just take that picture of you, you know, like, um, I, it would actually be kind of funny. You know, we have, we have a couple of professional athletes that eat our product and it's always hysterical to see like a giant football player with like a little animal cracker. You're like, yeah, you rock. <laughs> are there ones out there that are, that you can mention? Like who's, who's been seen in the wild eating a zebra? Yeah. So I would say the, probably the most recognizable is Jillian Michaels. Mm. That's a good one to have. Yeah. She, she's all about the chai ones. Cool. Love that. She likes chai. Yeah. So that's probably that one. And, um, you know, we can, you know, I, I'd be happy to regroup with you and talk about the female entrepreneur thing in greater, yeah. you know, you know, I'm not shy of an opinion. <laughs> yes. That could be like a 45 minute conversation. Um, so let's leave people with this. Um, Erica, Everyone should go to goodzebra.com. Check it out. You can go out on Amazon. If you happen to be frequent at Pete's uh, Coffee and Tea, check out Good Zebra there. Um, what else should we leave people with? Where should they go or anything else about Good Zebra that we haven't mentioned? You know, I think that really covers it up. We do have a bunch of specialty stores that are available, a list on our website where you can go in and put your zip code and find whether or not there's one near you. And you could also help us spread the word by asking your local retailers um, to pick us up. Very cool. They can email us through the website and we can take care of that real quick and easy. 
Eric, I want to be the first one to thank you. Um, I loved hearing the stories, so I appreciate it. Everyone check out goodzebra.com. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. 